Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 18 to 25. This second lecture is entitled, A Marriage Made on Earth. Uh, as we come to God's Word, let's pray. Father, our help is in you. Uh, the maker of heaven and earth. So we pray that you would help us now to concentrate our minds, uh, conform our wills to your will, and we pray that you would stir our affections for you, the living God. And we ask that you would show us the beauty of marriage and ultimately how it points to your son, the Lord Jesus, and his uh, marriage to your church, the bride. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis 2, 18 to 25, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed." Marriage, it's a topic that's unavoidable, and I don't just mean that it's in the media a lot in recent years with various campaigns and the legal attempt to redefine marriage. No, marriage is unavoidable for many reasons. For most of us, we were born into a married home, one man and one woman, a father and a mother. I realize there are exceptions to that, of course, but I think for most of us, that uh, was the case. But even if we weren't born into a married home, the fact is that marriage is still unavoidable for us. Because if we're honest, we all grow up thinking about marriage at some point in our lives. Uh, most young girls show, uh, grow up enjoying the stories of Cinderella or Rapunzel, where a princess meets a charming prince and gets married. Uh, while that's not really on a boy's mind when he's young, uh, once he hits his 20s, uh, the issue of marriage comes on his radar as he starts to meet young ladies at college or at church. And if we're beyond our 20s, marriage is not something we stop thinking about. Many of the single people in church feel it because they either long to be married or they watch their friends getting married. And then, of course, there are those who are married. Well, we really can't avoid it, can we? Uh, every day we live in it, think about it, act upon it. People who are divorced can't avoid marriage. They've experienced it and then carry around the pain of a broken marriage. Those who are widowed can't avoid marriage since they carry around with them the great pain of their absent spouse. Marriage is unavoidable. Whoever you are, whatever stage of life you are, and the reason for this is because marriage has been there from the beginning. In the beginning, God made them male and female. In the beginning, God made marriage. Marriage didn't evolve in the Bronze Age as apes came swinging out of the trees in middle Africa 10,000 years ago, or as the Neanderthal farmers came out of their caves now, marriage was made by God at the beginning of time and therefore is a divinely 
created institution. Marriage is not medieval. It's creational. Marriage was stitched into the fabric of creation from the very beginning of creation. And so, marriage continues as a central part of human history right up to the end of history. The Bible begins and ends with a wedding. Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding in Galilee. In the beginning, the marriage of Adam and Eve. In the middle, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. In the end, the marriage supper of the Lamb and His bride. Marriage has been here since the beginning of time, and it will be there at the end of time. Marriage is God's idea, and it's an idea that God wants to be front and center in His world, which is another reason why we can't avoid it. And therefore, it's also why we need to understand it, because marriage is central to the way God has made His world to work. Marriage is central to the way God has made His world to work. The story of the universe, the story of the heavens and the earth, can be captured in a single sentence that relates to marriage. Uh, this is how I summarize uh, the whole Bible to my students at uh, Westminster Theological Seminary. I summarize it like this. God's kingdom in a new creation under His Son and Bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. God's creation and a new creation under His Son and Bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. That's how Genesis begins, and that's what the rest of the whole Bible is about. God's kingdom and a new creation under His Son and Bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. And you can see how marriage is central to that story, central to the story of the heavens and the earth, His Son and Bride. So we need to understand marriage, <clears throat> whether we're married or not, whether we've had a good experience of marriage or not, or we need to understand marriage because it's central to God's plan for His universe. Now, this passage in Genesis 2 helps us understand marriage in three ways. Number one, marriage serves God's creation mandate. Marriage serves God's creation mandate. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So God's creation mandate from the beginning was for man and woman to multiply and be fruitful, to fill the earth and subdue it. Now, remember Genesis 2, 1 to 3 uh, skips ahead to the seventh day, and then Genesis 2, 4 to 25 returns to the creation of man on the sixth day. So the prologue of Genesis really goes from Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. Okay, we have a report of the seven days of creation. But chapter 2, 4 to 25 moves back a day to day 6, narrows in, zooms in on the creation of Adam and then the creation of his wife Eve. Now we know at the end of the creation week, uh, chapter 1, verse 31, that God said that everything He had made was very good. But on that day, before He said those words, He said something else. Chapter 2, verse 18, remember this is the sixth day. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. The rest of the paragraph from verses 19 to 25 is about how God fixes this one problem. It is not good for man to be alone. Now, if we're going to understand marriage properly, then we must understand exactly what God says here. He does not say, it's not good for man to be lonely. If He had said that, then He would have said, I will make him a friend. 
Perhaps even some of the animals might have qualified in this case. After all, isn't a dog a man's best friend? So the primary issue is not loneliness in life. Some bad marriages, uh, some people in bad marriages speak about the loneliness they experience in their marriage. So the problem in Genesis 2.18 is not loneliness in life. The problem is aloneness in work, aloneness in work. Now, don't get me wrong, a marriage partner is able to provide companionship, and relationship is the context out of which Eve's role will take place, but her primary role here stated is not that of companionship, but that of help for Adam in his work She is described here in verse 18 as a helper. And what is Eve to help Adam with? Well, broadly speaking, 126, she is to help him fill the earth and subdue it, to multiply and fill the earth, chapter 126 and 28. And then narrowly speaking, she is to help him work and keep the garden, the Garden of Eden. So this is the task that Eve is created into. She's to help the man fill and subdue the earth, and of course, working and keeping the garden comes into that. But the big picture is fill and subdue the earth. And it's in this sense that marriage serves God's creation mandate, because through marriage, Adam and Eve would be able to have children and take care of the garden. And this is the first thing that this passage teaches us about marriage. Marriage serves God's creation mandate. Man and his bride filling and subduing the world. Second thing we see about marriage in this passage is marriage represents God's creation order. Marriage serves God's creation mandate to fill the earth and subdue it. Second, Marriage represents God's creation order. And we see this in three ways. Number one, in marriage, the man is the head. In marriage, the man is the head. Now, by head, I mean authority. In marriage, the man is the authority. And this can be seen in our passage in two ways. The first is the order of creation. The man is made first, Genesis 2, 7, and then the woman is made in Genesis 2, 22 and following. Such an obvious point that Adam was made made first, hardly needs making, but it's an important point because it is the order of creation of the man and the woman which establishes the authority of the man over the woman. We see this in the New Testament. Paul argues for the authority of a man over his wife on the basis of the creational order in Genesis 2. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 8 to 10. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority over her head because of the angels. And 1 Timothy 2, 12 to 13, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. In other words, order matters. Order matters, because the order in which the man and the woman were created establishes the authority in their relationship. The order establishes the authority. It's not unlike the order of siblings. An older brother naturally carries more authority in the home when the parents are gone, simply because he was born first. If I may be all British for a moment, uh, why will Prince William get the British throne over Prince Harry? Well, because William was born first. Order matters. And in this case, the authority of the man derives from him being created first before the woman. So that's one way we see his headship in the marriage, by the order. And notice it's not about capacity or ability. Often women are more capable and able than men, but that's not the basis for the man being 
the head. The other way is Adam's actions. He is the head by order and second by his actions. Uh, This is seen in him naming and calling the animals. Adam acts in these verses, 19 to 20, with an authority that reflects God's authority, and he does so before the woman is created. And the verb that is used here, uh, calling and naming, it's the verb that is used of God in chapter 1. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. God called the expanse heaven. God called the dry land earth. God acts like a king with authority. He separates and divides, defines and names. And Adam does the same. He names the creatures. It is a God-like act of authority. Indeed, he even gives a name to the person made from his side. In verse 23, he says, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam names his wife, and in chapter 3, verse 20, he actually gives her her name, Eve. Some think that male headship in marriage is a post-fall reality and thus a product of sin. So Adam naming Eve, Eve after the fall is an example of him abusing his authority. How dare you name me? Um, But we can see uh, that Adam's authority to name uh, was occurring before Eve was even created. It was a pre-fall authority that he exercised. And it's this act of naming that establishes his authority in his marriage. It's a bit like when a woman takes her husband's surname when she marries him. There's a sense in which he has named her. So, from those two things, order and action, uh, we see that in marriage, the man is the head. But before we move on to the next aspect of God's good creation, I just want to pause and engage with two ways that as Christians we can either avoid this teaching or abuse this teaching of man's headship in marriage. Let me speak first about avoidance. What I've just explained from the Bible, that man is the head in marriage, is anathema in our secular culture. It's anathema in secularism, feminism, and egalitarianism, and dare I say it, even in some quarters of evangelicalism. It's easy as Christians to feel that kind of opposition feel that kind of hatred for this teaching and try to soften it a bit for our own surrounding culture, make it a wee bit more palatable or acceptable. It's easy to get embarrassed by it a bit and even join in the mocking of it. Uh, One of my favorite movies is My Big Fat Greek Wedding. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's this great moment where the mother is talking to her daughter who's about to get married, and she's all concerned about, you know, having to submit to her husband. And the mother says, oh, yes, yes, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck that turns the head. It's this sort of great moment where she's trying to relieve her daughter's anxiety. Yes, your husband will be the head, but you'll just control him the whole time. You know, and it's it's a bit of banter and funny, and we can have a laugh at it. But it's easy, actually, in our culture to want to laugh at it because we're a bit embarrassed that actually that's true. The man is the head of his wife. I think we see this today in weddings where uh, the wedding vow, the traditional wedding vow of a woman saying that she will love and obey her husband or love and submit to her husband, are, uh, the, that vow, that particular part, has now been dropped out of most Christian weddings. I can't remember the last time I was at a wedding where I heard uh, the bride uh, make that vow. The traditional vow acknowledges and states explicitly the headship of the man in the marriage. But when was the last time you heard that said at a Christian wedding? Our vows today have been egalitarian. They've become egalitarian because we're a bit embarrassed about what the Bible says 
Uh, often when we're at a wedding and I hear the wife say that she's going to, the bride say that she's going to love and protect her husband, I, I often joke with my wife Jackie, I said, well, when the burglar comes in a year into the marriage, is the husband going to say, well, off you go. You said you'd love and protect me, you know. So it's easy to become a bit embarrassed by it. But if we're going to claim to be Christians who love God and His Word and submit to it, then we need to submit to the order God has stitched into His creation. And that order is that in marriage, the man is the head. He is the one who is to love and protect his wife, not vice versa. Here's a second thing that we can do with this teaching of uh, the man being the head. We can avoid it, and second, we can abuse it. We can abuse it. Um, and because we can abuse it, I think we need to make some qualifications by what we mean when we say the man is the head. And the first qualification is those words, in marriage. In marriage. They're really important. In marriage, the man is the head. That is, the Bible does not teach that men in general are heads over women. That men in general carry authority over women. The Bible doesn't teach that. Only in marriage is the man the head of a woman. And the only woman he's a head of is his wife. This is really important. I, as a man today, have no authority over any of the women sitting here. I have not one ounce of authority over them. As a man, the only female person I have authority over is my wife, and that's because I've entered into a covenant with her in marriage. I think this qualification is important because I have seen in Reformed and evangelical circles a culture in which women are viewed as second class, or they're viewed as needing to submit to men just by the fact that they're men who they need to submit to, and they're women who need to submit. But that is a misuse, and at times an abuse, of the concept of the headship in marriage. Only in marriage is the man the head of one woman. So that's the first qualification here. The second qualification is what we mean by head or by authority. There are different kinds of authority in society and marriage. There's misused authority. There is abused authority. But there's also good authority. Authority done well is a beautiful thing. Authority done badly is an ugly thing. And the authority that God gave to Adam was a beautiful authority. He was to protect and provide for his wife as her head. Now, what would that look like for Adam? Well, I think his authority could be summed up in two words. Sacrificial responsibility. Sacrificial responsibility. Adam was to be responsible for his wife, and Adam was to sacrifice for his wife. This is what his authority was to look like. But what we find in chapter 3 is that Adam abdicates his responsibility at the first sight of danger to his wife, at the first sign of needing to exercise sacrificial responsibility. Adam abdicates his role. The serpent approaches Eve, which means she's in danger, and instead of fighting the serpent on her behalf at the risk of getting injured, the risk of his own life, he stands by her side in silence. He neither takes responsibility for her, nor is he willing to sacrifice for her in a struggle with the serpent. Adam should have crushed the serpent in the head and made himself vulnerable to a strike at the heel, but he refused to sacrifice. He refused to take responsibility. But that is what biblical headship was meant to look like, it's what authority should look like, sacrificial responsibility. And when it is done, it is a beautiful thing. A man protecting and providing for his wife so that she flourishes under his headship. Sadly, there are men in marriages who want the authority without the responsibility. And they're only willing to take on the responsibility 
if there is no sacrifice involved. But biblical headship means sacrificial responsibility. So those are two qualifications. Only in marriage is man the head of a woman, and his headship involves sacrificial responsibility for the sake of his wife. So that is our first point of how marriage represents God's creation order. In marriage, the man is the head. Here's the second aspect of how marriage represents God's creation order. In marriage, the woman is the helper. In marriage, the man is the head. In marriage, the woman is the helper. Now, our society tends to think the word helper is derogatory, demeaning, as if the woman is just there to be a man's slave or servant. But helper is a dignified role, not a derogatory role. And the passage shows us this in a number of ways. Notice what kind of helper she is to be, verse 18. A helper fit for him or suitable for him. It literally says in the Hebrew, like opposite to him. In other words, this helper is fit, suitable for him as a complement to him. It's not like Adam can take and leave her if he wishes and then find some other partner for the task. No, she is made like opposite to him, suitable to him, fit for him, corresponding to him, his complete complement, which means that she must be of the same kind of being as he is. She must be equal in essence if she is going to be complementary in function. This is the whole point of verses 19 to 20. There was no suitable fit opposite complementary helper in the animal kingdom. Look at verse 20. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. The woman is no animal. She is a complementary, equal opposite to Adam. She is opposite to him, and only because she is like him and opposite to him can she be his helper. She is equal in essence. And this is seen from where she is taken, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Matthew Henry describes the equality of the woman in a beautiful way. I think he was dependent on Theodore Beza for this. He said the woman was not taken from a bone in the skull to be above the man. She was not taken from a bone in the heel to be under the man. She was taken from a bone in his side to be beside him, close to his heart. And that equality is seen in what Adam speaks about this creature formed from his side. Verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The words at last indicate Adam's exasperation at not being able to find a suitable helper in the animal kingdom. But if he has now found a suitable helper from his side, then he has found a helper e equal to him. And isn't that what the beautiful poetry says? Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Even her name conveys equality. In the Hebrew, it sounds like the word for man. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. Ish, Isha. And then 24 also conveys equality. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Well, you can't become one flesh if you're not of the same equal flesh. 
So what we learn here is that though the woman is made second, and though this means in marriage she is under the man's authority, and though the woman is made to be the man's helper, she is equal to him in every essential way. There is no inequality. There is no inferiority, even as she assumes the role of helper. She is different, yes. She is helper, not head, yes. But she is equal in essence. In other words, in marriage, the woman is equal but different to the man. Equal in essence, bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, but different in function. The man is the head, the woman is the helper. So the woman loses no dignity in being a helper since she is still equal in essence with the man. Indeed, it is her equality of essence that helps serve as a suitable helper for the man because together they can now have offspring. So when the Bible assumes a different role for the woman compared to the man, it is not demeaning or derogatory. It is dignified. Indeed, the word for helper here in the Hebrew, uh, ezer, it's the same word used for God being the helper of Israel in Isaiah. But it's not just a dignified role. It's a powerful role or powerful role, as you say here in America. It's a, it's a powerful role because the man cannot complete his task without her. As a helper, she's in a position of strength. For if the man cannot complete his task alone, then the strength for him to complete his task is found in her, his complementary equal opposite. So not only is she equal but different to the man, she's also his strength. In other words, the word helper is neither derogatory nor demeaning. It's dignified and powerful. And just as God's role as Israel's helper is a position of strength, so too is the woman's. This is what's wrong with feminism and egalitarianism. They have not strengthened the position of wives and mothers, and I would say women in general in our society. They have weakened their position because the position of strength for a wife and a mother is beside her man in the task that God has given him, not away from her man in the big wide world of women's careers and women's rights. Years ago when I was at a Westminster graduation ceremony, a few students were asked to give a testimony of their time at seminary, and they were asked to comment on someone who had really influenced them or helped them through seminary. And one young man uh, had been given the remit to speak about those who had helped him in his three years. And he said, I'm only going to speak about one person. I'm going to speak about my wife. He said, if it wasn't for my wife, I could not have done this degree. Here was a young man considering ministry, going into ministry, and he had discovered where his true strength lay. It lay in his complementary other in his wife. So in marriage, the man is the head and the woman is the helper. These are the two aspects of how we see marriage representing God's creation order. There's a third aspect of how marriage represents God's creation order. In marriage, the man and the woman are one flesh. In marriage, the man is the head. In marriage, the woman is the helper. And third, in marriage, the man and the woman are one flesh. Verse 24, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. These words are not part of the narrative flow. They're the narrator's comment. Do you notice that? If you read verse 23 and 25 together, they would make complete sense. You wouldn't miss anything. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You don't need verse 24. 
the narrator, Moses, has stepped into the narrative and made a comment. And what he does here is he takes the first marriage and he makes it paradigmatic for all human marriages. He wants to convey a principle, and the principle is that in human marriage, one man and one woman become one flesh. The man was torn apart in order to receive back the part that was taken from him. And that's the point here. In marriage, the man and the woman do not live together side by side as two individuals. No, they live together as one person. They are two halves that make a whole, or perhaps I think it's better to say they are two wholes that make one whole. In God's world, that's the way maths works. One plus one equals one. Perhaps an analogy in biology would be that a sperm and an egg equals a zygote. One sperm plus one egg equals one zygote. One man plus one woman equals one flesh. So too in marriage. So again, this is very different to how our society thinks. Secular counseling on marriage, we'll speak of marriage, is the intimacy of growing up alongside each other as two life partners, as two best friends. Now, there's nothing wrong with thinking of marriage as a friendship between two people, of course, living beside each other in life, through life's journey, of course. But notice the language. It's predominantly about living alongside each other, two partners, two best friends. It's all about remaining an independent, autonomous individual, learning to get alongside the person you've decided to go through life's journey with. That is egalitarianism. That is not how the Bible presents marriage. Marriage is a mystery because in marriage, one man and one woman come together, not as two individuals learning to live together, but as one flesh. And not just in a sexual union, but all aspects of married life. In marriage, a man and a woman are one flesh, emotionally, physically, relationally, financially. There's a world of difference between this view of marriage and the world's view of marriage. So those are three aspects of how marriage represents God's creation order. In marriage, the man is the head. In marriage, the woman is the helper. In marriage, the man and the woman become one flesh. And when this equal but different dynamic of the husband and wife relationship occurs like this, functions like this, it reflects God's creation order. And then it helps to serve God's creation mandate. Remember, those were the first two points. Marriage serves God's creation mandate. Marriage reflects God's creation order. And when a marriage reflects God's creation order, it serves God's creation mandate to fill the earth and subdue it. But marriage also uh, there's also something else about marriage, which brings us to our final point here. Marriage has not changed, nor will it ever. Marriage has not changed, nor will it ever. And here I want to read Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 31 and 32. Paul is giving instructions to husbands and wives to the church in Ephesus. And in verse 31, he quotes Genesis 2, 24. He says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The amazing thing that Paul says here about marriage is that it is not primarily about a man and a woman. He says that it is primarily about Christ and the church. That's the profound mystery that Paul is talking about here. The relationship between Christ and His church does not illustrate human marriage. 
Human marriage illustrates the relationship between Christ and His church. That is what marriage is, an illustration of Christ and His church. This is the reason why we Christians are opposed to same-sex marriage, because same-sex marriage preaches a false gospel. Of course, we're opposed to same-sex marriage because it does not affirm the natural good of creation, and therefore it is not for the common good of society. There is no natural flourishing in a same-sex marriage. Two men can't have babies. Two women can't have babies. There's no natural human flourishing in same-sex marriage. We are opposed to it for that reason, yes, but here's the primary reason. It preaches a false gospel. Christ did not die for another Christ. The church does not submit to another church. Christ died for the church, and the church submits to Christ. That's the gospel. And that's the gospel that every human marriage, not just Christian marriages, Every human marriage, because marriage was stitched into creation as a creation ordinance, every human marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. And precisely because human marriage is an illustration of the marriage between Christ and the church, marriage has not changed, and marriage will never change, because the gospel does not change, nor will the gospel ever change. Marriage is still about one man and his bride serving God's creation mandate. One man and his bride filling and subduing the earth. Marriage is still about one man and his bride representing God's creation order. One man and his bride being united together as one. You see, Genesis 2 is not really about Adam and Eve at all, is it? It is about a marriage made on earth. It's just not about Adam and Eve's marriage made on earth. Genesis 2 is really, ultimately, in the end, about Christ and His church, which is a marriage made on earth. And that marriage serves God's creation mandate. And that marriage represents God's creation order. And that's why marriage can't be avoided as I said in my introduction, because ultimately the relationship between Christ and His church cannot be avoided, because that marriage between Christ and His church is central to the story of the universe. That is where the whole of history is heading towards, the marriage supper of the Lamb and His bride. God's kingdom in a new creation under His Son and Bride, awaiting a Sabbath rest. That's where the whole of history is heading towards. Genesis 1 and 2 contains all the DNA revelation of the whole Bible. And at the heart of that DNA is a one flesh union, the union of God's Son with His Bride, whom He received from His riven side. At the heart of the story of the universe is the doctrine of union between Christ and His church. Jackie and I have just celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary. Uh, Fourteen years ago, my lovely wife walked in uh, to uh, the Hallelujah Chorus down the longest red carpet in Sydney, Australia. I told the musician who was, or the the PA guy who was playing the music, I said, I want it turned up full crank. That's what she walked into, the Hallelujah Chorus, Handel's Messiah. Why did we choose that? Because in Revelation, the Hallelujah Chorus is what is sung at the wedding of the Lamb and His Bride. Why did we choose it? Because we wanted our marriage to reflect the marriage of Christ and His church. And that's the challenge for us and for all those who are married. 
What kind of gospel does your marriage reflect? What kind of gospel does your marriage preach? Because every human marriage is an illustration of Christ and His church. So may God give us the grace to preach the true gospel in our lives and in our marriages. Amen.